Thank you very much, Maggie, for that wonderful introduction. And actually, I can't tell you how honored I feel to be part of this meeting. It's, uh, it's really quite amazing. Uh, I've enjoyed the sessions I've been to today, and I'm looking forward to all the sessions in the next couple of days. What I thought I would do is talk about uh, the discovery of green fluorescent protein and my involvement in it as an example of um, maybe myth busting about science. So I want to start off by telling you all the myths, all the incorrect things I was taught when I was in high school in the mid 1960s, early and mid 1960s. Uh, these were all the things, I wasn't really taught these specifically, but all the examples of all the great scientists, whether it was Darwin or Newton or Einstein, all of these examples gave me an idea about who scientists were and how scientists were, was done. And I'm gonna tell you that the GFP story makes a lie out of all of them. So what are these things? So what was I taught about scientists? First, scientists are geniuses. It's innate. If you don't have it at birth, forget about it. Second, scientists experiment work all the time because we don't have time to tell you about the failures. Third, scientists use this special, strange way of thinking called the scientific method. They're very purposeful. They think of what they're going to do, do the experiment, get the right answer, and get the acclamation, all because they use the scientific method. As I tell you, all of these things are not true. The next thing is that scientists, all these great scientists that we hear about, until you hear about Watson and Crick, they all work alone. Now, they might have an assistant named Igor, but basically they're on their own. They don't collaborate. And the final thing that all these examples that I heard when I was growing up seem to say is that except for one person, Marie Curie, all of the scientists were white men. So I want to tell you about, a little about myself and about how I got involved with GFP. So a little background. Uh, and today I went to the Insight uh, to Success session and I heard people talk and several of them said that they had a very rough time their freshman year in college, and then they came back on track, and, and that was very nice. I, it took me a little longer. Um, so the points along the way, I really liked math and science, but I decided math was too hard for me, so I dropped out of that. In college, I do not show anyone my college grades in chemistry and physics because they're abysmal. Um, I did a summer lab project. I had an opportunity to work in a lab. I did one experiment the entire summer. Every time I did it, it failed. When the person I was working for talked to me, he said, well, come back after the term is over, or when the term starts, and do it one more time. If it doesn't work, we're going to have to drop it. I did it that one more time, and it didn't work. And I quit science. I then had uh, several years in which I did a lot of non-science things. I was a janitor, I interviewed people, I was a dress salesman, I organized rock par uh, concerts in parks, and I was a high school teacher. And because high school teachers need to have jobs in the summer, I, was a I, I got a job working in a laboratory, and to my complete amazement, that time the experiments I was working on actually worked out and gave me the confidence to go back and think about going to graduate school and that it was really something I liked to do. So it took me not my freshman year, but well past when I had graduated college to find out that I actually still was very much in love with being a, of doing science. So I returned. Uh, I've been working with a small roundworm, Nemto, called Centerabdias elegans. And one of the nice things about this animal is it's transparent. But as you can see in this picture, you can't really tell anything about this. And I'm interested in these six cells. And you certainly can't see them in the animal. So we have to do a lot of indirect work. And then in 1989, I heard a seminar. And in the seminar, the speaker described the work of this man, Osama Shimomura, and his work on the jellyfish Aquaria Victoria. 
Uh, the, Osamu shared the Nobel Prize in 2008. His story is astonishing. I urge you to go to nobelprize.org and listen to, watch his lecture and listen to his story. At the age of 16, he was told, you can't be in school anymore. You have to quit school and work in a factory. So he quits school, quits high school, goes across the mountain, over the mountains that are adjacent to the city he was living in, and he works in a factory. This actually turns out to be advantageous because the year is 1945 and the city is Nagasaki, Japan. And by being on the other side of the mountains, he was saved from the destruction of the city caused by the atomic bomb. He went in and rescued people and helped people, but he couldn't go to college because there was no college. It had been destroyed. He eventually goes to pharmacy school. From pharmacy school, he gets a job as a technician. And as a technician, he shows real brilliance in the work that he's doing that gets him invited to the United States. And he's interested in one problem, a very basic biological problem. How is it that some organisms can generate light? And he goes off to study this jellyfish found in Puget Sound, Aquaria Victoria. And he's a very good biochemist. And he isolates things. And he is trying to get the molecule that produces light. And he does the experiment over and over and over again. Maybe you get a theme in my talk here. And it doesn't, they don't work ever at all. Now, this is where the scientific method comes in. He thinks about what he should do, and he comes up with some ideas. They don't work. But one night, he's done the prep one more time. Still hasn't worked. He wants to go home. It's late. He wants to have dinner. He takes the prep. He throws it away in the sink. The sink has the overflow from the various tanks they have for the jellyfish. So there's a lot of seawater in the sink. He throws the things away turns off the light, he's just about to go away, and he looks back at the sink, and it's glowing brightly. He thinks about it a little while and realizes that the seawater had calcium in it, and maybe that's what was missing from his prep. And sure enough, that is the thing that's missing. He's able to purify the protein, which he names after the jellyfish, he names it a corin. But he's still not out of the woods, because the jellyfish produce a green light, and this produces a blue light. He realizes there must be another protein, something that takes the green light and converts it to the blue light and converts it to green. And he searches for it and he finds it. When he write, writes the paper about it in 1962, he has a footnote that says, I found this other protein that if you shine light on it, you can get green out. I think he's the only person to get a Nobel Prize for a footnote. Uh, and, but that is the molecule that's needed. He called it the green protein. We call it green fluorescent protein. I want to point out something about his name. You see that it's in black. I want to tell you my color code for the names on my slides. Anyone whose name is in red is someone from my laboratory. Anyone whose name is in blue is a collaborator. And anyone whose name is in black did something I wish I had done. So, well, I'm listening to the seminar and I hear about this and I work on a transparent animal and I realize that if we could put this molecule into the animal and sh just put blue light on it, we'd be able to get green light out. So I was very excited about this and in fact don't remember anything else about the seminar because I realized that this would be pro providing a lantern in the cells or in an organism to be able to see things happening. I got very excited and found that this man, Douglas Prasher, was in the process of isolating the cDNA. We made an agreement to collaborate, and then we immediately lost track of each other for about three years. But after three years, I had a new graduate student come to the lab, Gia Skirkin, and she already had some experience working on fluorescence, and so I said, you've got to do this project. And she started off, and one month after she started graduate school, uh, this is the page from her lab notebook, she found strongly fluorescing E. coli. It worked. We put it in. This is one of these cases where the experiment did work the first time. And this picture that I show here 
These dots are the bacteria that had the GFP in them so on that very first day. But you probably can't read this uh, lab notebook page, but there's another part here about maybe how science can be done that I've circled up here. What this says is that um, she used the microscope, not in our lab, but in the engineering lab that she had originally gotten her master's in. And the reason for that is she knew that the microscope in my lab was a piece of junk. And in fact, if you looked at these bacteria under our microscopes, it was really hard to tell if the experiment worked or not. So she knew where there was a good microscope. But as you can imagine, this is a real problem of trying to do science, because if you don't have a microscope and you're trying to do this work, it just doesn't work. I solved this problem by calling up all the sales representatives of the various microscope companies and telling them that we had just developed a new method to look at gene expression. We were very excited about it and we were going to buy a new microscope, but before we did, we had to try all the microscopes out. So if they would bring it by for about two months, I think that would be a reasonable test. And in fact, we did all of our experiments on borrowed microscopes. We eventually bought one, but the, um, we were able to uh, put it into worms as well. We sent off the paper for science. I want to say a brief thing about the problems of publication. We wanted it to be in science because it would, be, it would reach the most people, and we were very excited. But you may know that the editors of science are very snooty. They, ha they have to decide that the paper is worthy before they send it out. And when we sent the paper in, they, they wrote me and they said, or they called me and they said, we're sorry, we're not gonna be able to uh, have your paper reviewed. I asked them why, they said we don't like the title. Title of the paper was Green Fluorescent Protein, A New Marker for Gene Expression. I thought it was a little snappy, I thought it was good. They said every article in the journal Science is new. You cannot use the word new in the title. So I don't like being told what to do. So uh, I said, well, I'll change the title, but I, the title I submitted was rather long. It was the Aquaria Victoria Green Fluorescent Protein Needs No Exogenously Added Component to Produce a Fluorescent Product in Prokaryotic and Eukaryotic Cells. Actually, after this, I didn't think I had to write the paper. It was all there. <laughs> and it got accepted, and then the copy editor called me up and said, you know, your title is a little long. Would you consider shortening it? And I said, okay, how about green fluorescent protein as a marker for gene expression? And that's the official title. The second problem comes with the picture that was on the cover of Science, which I've sort of doctored up to make it look better. Because what happened is the art editor called me up and said, you know, that that picture, we really want to use it. And I want to use it because it shows a living animal and a nerve cell growing out of it, it, within it. And they said, but there's a problem, and that is we never like to put the color green on our covers. Do you mind if I change the color? I said, no, I don't want to do that. The third problem we had trying to publish this paper was that we had already given away samples to people, and they were already getting back to us saying that it worked in their systems. And I wanted to be able to say that in the article, so I needed their permission. All but one person was really terrific about this and said, absolutely, you gave it to us before publication, you can cite our work. But one person made an enormous number of demands. This is the letter, and as you can see, the demands are that I make, if you could read the thing, it says to make coffee every Saturday morning for two months to prepare a special French dinner at a time of my choosing and to take out the garbage monthly, of, or daily for the next month. This is my wife. <laughs> and what Tula did though was really quite terrific because she was the first person to make a protein fusion, to put GFP on a protein and watch the protein move, in her case, in development of oocytes. GFP is useful and why it's been used by so many people is because we can add it to an organism uh, as a piece of, it, of DNA and so it's inherited from one to the other. Looking at it by shining blue light onto the organism doesn't hurt the organism so it's non-invasive. It's small size so it allows the cells to fill completely and you can use it again in living animals. 
Uh, in other words, we can now see the cells we want, and here's an example of us to do this. We've used GFP in a number of ways, and I won't go into these now, in our own work of looking at gene expression, isolating cells, and because it's in living animals to find mutants that are defective in nerve outgrowth and development. GFP has been used in a wide variety of organisms. In fact, uh, it's been used in virtually any organism you want to uh, imagine. The only organism where the evidence is a little doubtful is us. There, I, I know that it's been put into human cells in culture, but I only know of one instance where anyone has even claimed that GFP has been used to make a transgenic human, and that's this person. <laughs> if you look at the Ang Lee movie Hulk, in fact, he does start off with a jellyfish, or they extract the GFP from it, and that's why GFP clearly went into a gene that's turned on by anger, and so that's why the Hulk turns green. I'm going to show you two quick movies to show you the aspect of living, uh, the, the, of being able to see these things in a living animal. One of them looks at cell division, which is diagrammed here, and it will mark the spindle, so you'll see what's happening during the division. The other has GFP attached to a peptide that brings it into the nucleus, but when, during division there is no nucleus, so it goes all over the cell. So if uh, people in the back can start the first movie, this is the spindle, this is Drosophila development, and you're watching very speeded up cells dividing. And I hope you can see that because we're looking at this as in a live animal, that all of this is synchronous. And so it immediately invites questions of how does this synchrony come about? If we look at the slide on the right-hand side, this is falsely colored. So the more GFP that goes into the nucleus, the brighter the color is in the nucleus. And so you hear, again, division. Now the nuclei are reforming. They're going to divide again. Nuclei break down, cell division takes place, and again, it's all over the embryo, and then it comes back up into these cells. This is not synchronous, and we actually think that there's been a perturbation of this particular embryo so that it no longer looks synchronous, but gives this nice wave pattern going across the animal. But it's this ability to look in the living animal that really has been advantageous. Now, uh, I want to quickly point out a couple of other things. Roger Chen was the third person to share the prize with us. One of the things he did out of many things that he did was to make different colors, and that's been used by Josh Shanes and Jeff Lickman to make these wonderful pictures of mouse brain in what they call brainbow. It's also been used by other people attempting, it hasn't quite succeeded yet, but to use GFP as a marker for various things, including one is to actually detect landmines, and I'll be happy to talk to people about that uh, afterwards. But I want to talk, tell you what GFP has taught me. So the first thing is GFP has taught me that scientific success comes in many routes. I told you Osama Shimomura's story. I told you how I had very bad grades and dropped out of science and then finally came back. Roger Chen was one of these students that won the high school, the Intel Science Search Prize. So he was on a fast track to, to doing great science from the beginning. It doesn't make any difference. We all somehow got at the end and accomplished something that people found useful. The other thing is that I think many, if not most, discoveries are accidental. Uh, Enrico Fermi, the great physicist, uh, said if you do an experiment and it confirms your hypothesis, then you've made a measurement. But if you do an experiment and it doesn't confirm your hypothesis, then you've made a discovery. And that's very important. I think it's very important not to listen to people. We were told by everyone that GFP would not work on its own. It's good to be stubborn, ignorant of the real facts as people think they know them, and have a willingness to try things. There's something that usually is referred to, or I refer to it as a weekend experiment. This is an experiment that you go into the lab on the weekend because you don't think anyone else is going to be there and you try some crazy idea. 
And if it works, you crow about it on Monday. And if it doesn't work, you just ask everyone how their weekend went. <laughs> Third, scientific progress is not done by individuals. It's cumulative. It's not, I mean, everything started in this case with Osama Shimomura, but it was not me or uh, Douglas Prasher or Roger Chen or my wife or Gia Skirke. It was all of us together and all the really thousands of people that have added. I actually like to think about GFP as a metaphor for how we do science because just as GFP takes in blue light and converts it to green light, we take in the information and observations of others, change them by our experiments and thoughts, and then give them off in a changed way to be taken up by someone else and on down the line. So science is cumulative. I think this story of GFP also says that we should be studying all of life, not just some model organisms. And finally, that what's really important, even though GFP has been used in industry, it's been used to study human disease, it started with a question of how do some organisms generate life. The basic research is absolutely essential for everything else we need. And I want to end with a quote that I love from Robert Wilson, who was the first head of the Fermi Lab. He was asked when the government in 1969, this is the height of the Vietnam War, they were at, he was asked by a congressional committee how is this particle physics lab going to be important for the national defense? He said, it's not. Congress people didn't want to hear that. They, wanted, they kept pushing him. No, no, what about national security? Nothing. And finally, they asked again, in what respect is this lab going to be important for the national defense? And Robert Wilson said, it has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with way, whether we are good painters, good sculptors, great poets. I mean all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending the country except to make it worth defending. Thank you very much.